Good afternoon and welcome to Connecticut's Old State House. My name is Paul Jaguer and I'm the President and CEO of the Connecticut Public Affairs Network, the nonprofit organization that has managed the educational and community programs here at the Old State House in partnership with the Connecticut General Assembly since 2008. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here for this very special Conversations at Noon, where for the next hour or so we will honor the legacy of Bill Foudy. I consider myself fortunate that uh, I had an opportunity to work with Bill during the time of the great restoration of this building in the 90s, and particularly proud to call him a friend. I was part of a team that created a regular television program called This Old State House, where the rebirth of this historic icon was documented in painstaking detail. Each program included an appeal where Bill would look directly into the camera and in a way that only Bill could do, just pull on your heartstrings and ask for your support of the old state house. And once in a while, he'd throw in a little curveball, like the day he came in and he announced an all-out effort to find the two-headed calf. <laughs> and he would look into the, into the camera and he'd say, if you know of someone who has a two-headed calf, call me. If you know of someone who knows of someone who has an old two-headed calf, call me. If you know of someone who knows of someone that has a two-headed calf, call me. And uh, as you'll see in the video clip that we're about to show, um, he found one, and it's here today, upstairs. You should take a look before you go. Over the last eight years since we've been involved here, Bill would periodically call and just to chat or occasionally to complain. Um, like the day he called and said to me, one of the gold statues on the top of the flagpole is facing in the wrong direction. It may be loose. Uh, we had to replace it once. It was very expensive. You don't want that to happen again. <laughs> so in this instance, we can all count ourselves fortunate because one of the last conversations that the staff had with Bill um, was just a, a few short weeks ago, and he uh, documented the proper orientation of all of the flagpole statues that encircle the building. His eye for detail knew no limit, nor did his love for this building. Bill believed that the old state house should be more than just a museum where people come to look at stuff. It needed to be a place to experience history, to bring people together like this, to create a sense of community, to help people understand the significance of the events that occurred here, as well as the people who helped shape who we are today. Over the last hundred years, there are many who can be credited with saving the old state house from demolition or irrelevance. Bill's name is forever etched on that list. And in my mind, it includes a gold star for extreme exuberance. Back in the 90s, I could never have imagined being part of the team working now to continue Bill, Bill's legacy. But today I can think of nothing more important and nothing that my organization and, uh, and I undertake with more pride and gratitude for the contributions he made and the foundation he laid quite literally for this site. So again, I welcome you all here and at this point, I'm honored to introduce the mayor of the great city of Hartford. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Luke Bronin who will make a very special presentation. Thank you. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is a great city of Hartford. Uh, and the reason it is so great is because of people like Bill, uh, who love this city so deeply and who give themselves to it so completely. Uh, and so to Janet and uh, Anne and Sarah and Paul, uh, I'm so sorry for your loss. It is a loss for our whole community. Uh, but we are also so incredibly grateful to you uh, for sharing Bill with us and for all that he gave to this city. 
I didn't have the chance to know Bill as long as many of you in this room, but I did have the chance to serve with him on the Governor's Residence Conservancy, uh, and I'm so glad that I did, uh, because exuberance is the right word, um, so is creativity, uh, commitment, uh, and just an incredible recognition of the power of history uh, to unite us and to inspire us today. Um, it is extraordinary to look around this room where so much history happened and to know that uh, without Bill and others uh, united in the, with the same mission, uh, this may well have been lost. Uh, and to think about the role that he played uh, at the Mark Twain House uh, here through the 14 books uh, and through just his uh, constant uh, unwavering commitment to the city, uh, it is an extraordinary legacy uh, of an extraordinary person. So, uh, Janet, thank you. Our prayers will be with you. We will miss him, but we are so grateful for everything he gave. Uh, I have the honor of uh, performing two uh, official duties here. Uh, the first is a proclamation, and much of this proclamation is uh, a recitation of all of the tremendous things that Bill did in his life, and I know we'll hear much more about that. And I'm not going to go down the entire CV, but I want to get to the important thing, which is that whereas today, June 27th, at the Old State House, a conversation at noon will reflect on Bill Foudy's outstanding life, his creativity, his commitment to preservation, and his enthusiastic promotion of Hartford. Now, therefore, it be resolved that I, Luke Bronin, Mayor of the City of Hartford, along with the Court of Common Council and the citizens of Hartford, do hereby proclaim Tuesday, June 27, 2017, as Wilson H. Bill Foudy Day in the City of Hartford. And now, I have the honor of presenting the flag that flew over this old state house on the day that Bill died. Uh, Janet, I'm going to hand this flag to you, but I want to just read the statement that was made by the uh, State Capitol Police Chief, Walter Lee, uh, on this flag. Quote, the accompanying flag of the state of Connecticut was flying over the Connecticut Old State House on May 22, 2017. That is the day that Wilson Hinsdale Foudy, Bill, passed away. Bill was an extraordinary man with many accomplishments, one of which was being an integral part of the preservation of the Old State House. He served as the executive director of the Old State House from 1978 to 1982 and 1985 to 2001. He will forever be remembered for all he did with a legacy that will go on for future generations. So, Janet, I'm going to present you with this flag of the state that Bill loved, flying over the building that he helped save. And as I do it, I just wanted to ask everybody in the audience to imagine a cannon firing. Thank you, Mayor. At this time, I had mentioned that we have a short video, which we'd now like to play. In 1971, Wilson Foudy, known as Bill, was just 25 years old and fresh from a tour in Vietnam as a non-combatant when he was named the first curator of the Mark Twain House. Foudy presided over a major renovation, and three years later, when the house turned 100 years old, Bill attracted the national spotlight to Hartford, the home, and its most famous citizen. In 1975, Bill took on the fight to preserve another city landmark. When Hartford decided to demolish one of the oldest state houses in the nation to create a parking lot, Bill worked with then city councilor Barbara Kennelly and others to spare the structure. I'm Bill Foudy. I'm the director of the old state house. The Our director, panel, the savior, the and the reimaginer. Well, if you've always done your hands off, don't breathe, don't touch, don't think, 
and the building gets threatened with demolition, then maybe the old way isn't working. Maybe if we let the kids and the adults in the chamber and start making their history, maybe if we make it more interactive and more exciting, maybe if we take the shroud off and let you experience the joy of the building, maybe this will do more to save the building because the other ways didn't work. Saudi became the building's fundraiser in chief and number one cheerleader. It's your old state house, it's your heritage, creating jobs, open to the public. We need your support. Everybody knows about cutbacks. I ask you to send your contributions to the old state house. It's tax exempt, nonprofit. We're doing this for you. Every aspect of the three year, $12 million renovation and restoration was documented on video. In 1996, the new Old State House, as he called it, opened to Foudy fanfare that included a visit from George Washington, live music, hanging new art on its old walls, and daily cannon fire. The charges were hand prepared by Bill using a propellant and tin foil. The restoration included the reopening of the Steward Museum of Curiosities, featuring a two headed calf and Bengal tiger. Bill Foudy was a showman who once turned up at the Big E costumed as a statue of Hartford founder Reverend Thomas Hooker. The 1997 movie Amistad by Steven Spielberg provided Foudy a golden opportunity to showcase the old state house and a piece of its history. He directed and performed in a twice weekly recreation of the 1839 trial of the Amistad captives that took place in its Senate chamber. He has illegally purchased these children from pirates who kidnapped them from their home. I will seriously object to that. Bill campaigned to make the old state house a vital part of a vibrant city. His passion for the place never dimmed. These are great Connecticut stories, and to retell them in the very place, the very site, with the very walls where it took place, that's history. That's history alive. Wilson Fowdy. Another one of the great Connecticut stories. Hi, my name is Sally Whipple, and I'm the director of the Old State House, following in Bill's footsteps, and I feel like I've um, been watching Bill for years and years working on things that I love and I wanted to share, share some thoughts with you um, for, from the perspective of an insider who has taught in the spaces that Bill created and seen firsthand how his work has touched the lives and imaginations of thousands of people. I want to share some memories to sort of set the scene and the memories may not be accurate but they're mine and I've had them for a long time. <laughs> In the first one, I'm about five years old, and I'm in the front hall of the Mark Twain house, and in my mind's eye, it's a small, gloomy gift shop, not the sparkling room it is now. I see a book in a basket and beg someone to buy it for me. I cherish my copy of Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court to this day, and I also, on that day, fell in love with the Mark Twain house. Later, I was in grad sc uh, grade school. My mother, I can see my mother herding four kids toward the bus stop on Central Row. Someone needs a restroom, and my mother steers us toward the lower level of the old state house. As pigeons and papers swirl around the doorway, she tells us how important the old state house is, what an important building it is to Hartford and to the country, although it's seen better days. And she warns us not to wander too far away. When we come out, I look up at the old state house, and I fall in love with this building as well. Fast forward to the summer of my sophomore year in college. I had worked in Fox, at Fox's in high school and I wanted to do something different. So I applied for a job as a tour guide at the Mark Twain House and the Harriet Beecher Stowe House and I got the job. Um, I started working there during that summer and I continued to work there after I graduated and then on through graduate school. So I spent a long time at the Mark Twain House. Since then, I figure I've spent about 20 years working in the two buildings that Bill Foudy brought to life and it has been a tremendous experience. My memories tell me that both the Mark Twain House and the Old State House had power and meaning, even when I imagine them as places with gift shops and restrooms from my childhood. But their restorations and Bill's vision have multiplied their power and meaning thousands of times over. 
Without Bill Foudy, without Jared Edwards, without all of the people who worked to save and restore these treasures, we would have lost so much and we wouldn't even have understood what we lost. I think that um, my colleagues here and their past colleagues of Bill's who used to work in this building, there are people who work at the Mark Twain House, I think that all of us know the power of working in these rooms that have been restored so lovingly. I have seen countless people walk into Mark Twain's front hall and stop short with wonder. Their eyes adjust to the darkness and they see what Bill wanted them to see, a house that looks as if the Clemens have just stepped out and will be back at any moment. That is the magic of that house. They understand, the visitors, without a word spoken, that this was a place made for family, for friendships, and for creativity. Questions come into their minds and they're ready to learn. And that's something very valuable to someone who's giving a tour. Likewise, I've seen countless of people walk into the Senate upstairs and stop short with wonder. Their eyes adjust to the brilliant yellow and the sun streaming through the giant windows, and they see what Bill wanted them to see. They understand without a word spoken that this was a place made for power, justice, and debate. As in Mark Twain's front hall, questions come to mind, and they are ready to learn. It is a beautiful experience to show those rooms to people and help them understand more about what they meant. A good restoration depends on scholarship, keen observations of material culture and human nature, curiosity, and imagination. A great restoration has these qualities, but it also invites people to question, observe, and imagine lives and ideas that they hadn't even considered before. A great restoration is a work of art. It is also a useful tool that tour guides and educators can use to spark conversations, understanding, and memories. The Old State House and the Mark Twain House are great restorations. We tour guides experience them in ways that most do not. We see their impact reflected in the faces of children, adults, visitors from home and from abroad. That's a gift. We have Bill's vision, drive, humor, and well-directed passions to thank for that. I thank him every day that I'm in this building or in the Mark Twain house. He left us a tremendous legacy and has taught so many people so much about the past and the present. Thank you all for being here. Now, I would like to introduce Diane Smith of the Connecticut Network, who is going to have a wonderful discussion with our panelists, Bill Hosley, Jared Edwards, and Tom Condon, and you can come right on up. And there will be time for questions as well. Thank you all for coming today. Um, as soon as we heard about Bill, we said we have to do something special and um, you're helping make it really special. And the mayor, I uh, contacted the mayor's office, and I don't even think I had barely hit send on the email when I got back. Absolutely, we'll be there. So thank you, Mayor. Uh, Janet, I think that you probably have known over the years how much um, all of Bill's attitude, his philosophies, and his hard work have meant to the city of Hartford, and I hope we can remind you of that a little bit. I want to introduce my guests um, sitting Right next to me is Tom Condon. Uh, some of you know Tom because he's written for many years about urban and regional issues. Right now he writes for ctmirror.org. He writes about things like planning, transportation, land use, development, and historic preservation. And these were among his areas of interest in a 45-year career as a reporter, a columnist, and an editorial writer for the Hartford Current. Tom has won dozens of journalism and civic awards and was elected to the New England Newspaper Hall of Fame in 2016. Welcome, Tom. Uh, sitting in the center is Bill Hosley. Welcome, Bill. Bill is a cultural resource development and marketing consultant. He's a historian, a preservationist, a teacher, a writer, and a photographer. Uh, Bill was formerly the director of the New Haven Museum and director of Connecticut Landmarks. He has advised hundreds of museums and heritage destinations around the nation. He was the co-founder in 1993 of Historic Hartford, an agenda aimed at capitalizing on the city's abundant cultural resources. Thanks for being here. 
and Jared Edwards. Uh, Jared and Tyler Smith founded the Hartford Architect Architecture Conservancy in 1973. After that, they formed Smith Edwards Architects in 1977. Their firm provides architectural design services in the areas of rehabilitation, historic preservation, and landmark restoration. Its projects include notable museums and historic landmarks, that have been restored and recognized with professional design awards and recognition in the national media. In 2009, the Connecticut Commission on Culture and Tourism awarded Jared and Tyler the Governor's Award for Excellence in Historic Preservation. And again, thank you for saving this beautiful building for us. Uh, Tom, I want to start with you. Um, I was reading Dan Har's wonderful story when Bill passed away. And he called him in his first sentence, I think, a crusading preservationist. That really is what he was, right? Oh, of course, absolutely, no, no question. I mean, he was a teacher. I mean, um, and the most imaginative teacher. Um, I, you know, I mean, how many, you know, the Amistad story was not well known in Connecticut, though it's one of Connecticut's finest hours, until Bill Foudy uh, started doing recreations of it. I mean, the Amistad was not well, you know, I mean, you know, Helen Higgins and nine other people knew about it. I mean, that was it. <laughs> Um, but now, now it's now, now it is part of the legacy. I got to tell this quick story. Bill, Bill and I were soccer parents together, right? You know, when our kids were little, and you know, I, I mean, you'd be surprised to learn that some adults take this way too seriously. Um, so, you know, going to the first game, and I'm wondering, God, is it going to be a big, you know, is going to be a big bunch of fanatics and and, and what have you, and. Um, I looked, and there is Bill Foudy, the chaise lounge lawn chair, <laughs> and the Sunday Times. <laughs> not, not just the main news section, the whole thing. <laughs> and, and so, so I thought, God, the, that's the right perspective. He's got it. He's doing it right. So I raced to the car and got my lawn chair. <laughs> and, for the whole season, we, we had this, you know, we had this kind of uh, tutorial. You know, we'd cheer as the kids ran by and then get back to talking about saving the Colt building or, wh you know, whatever the issue of the day was. And it was, I mean, uh, I mean, of all the time in my life I've wasted watching sports, <laughs> this was far and away the most productive. Um, you know, and, and, and we, we, and, uh, you know, we cheer for the kids back, you know, back to, you know, how, how could we get the National Park Service involved, all this, all, all of this, all this stuff. So a, 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 um, a terrific experience because he shared, I mean, he, he for, those, for those two, two periods, he was my teacher. <laughs> so, so it was wonderful. And I, I'll just make the, two of the points that in these conversations they draw out, we'll just throw out there. One, there, there were people who said, we can't afford to do historic preservation, it's too expensive. Bill's response, we can't afford not to do it because historic preservation is economic development or is a variation of economic development. It, is, it, it creates jobs, it increases tourism, it saves the cost of demolition. How much it would have cost to demolish this building? I mean, just in money, not in loss, the loss of its soul. Um, and, and it makes it makes a city more attractive, more interesting, and, and, and in effect, it is economic development. And he made this point over and over again, and he was one of the first people I ever heard say this, and now it has become a tenant of the National Trust of Historic Preservation. Everybody in historic preservation now says this, and it's true, um, but, but he, was, he was way ahead of the curve on it. Second thing, second point he liked to make was that Hartford could be, should be, and could be revitalized from the center out, um, and and I think the reason he thought this is because he knew how it was developed the first time, from the center out, and and I think he believed that if you did that again, it would eventually build on itself. And, and it's interesting. Over time, that's what's happened. Yeah. I mean, it it has moved to the north and finally finally over the highway, uh, however difficult that was, um, it has moved to the south, it has moved to the river. And, and, that, and you know, you never know how much you influence thinking, but Bill somehow influenced this, uh, this way of thinking about development. So two points that he made in our conversations on the soccer field. 
Uh, Phil, I wanted to um, talk to you a little bit about Bill's way of thinking, because um, that video that I put together, I loved his comment when he said, um, if you lock things up and you say, don't touch, don't breathe, don't think, and your building is slated for demolition, maybe you better try another approach. Explain what his approach was. Well, Bill, Bill was a scholar, to be sure. Uh, I actually first met him in 1978 when he was a keynote speaker at a conference uh, in uh, Philadelphia and just took down the house. He was so uh, charismatic. And as a graduate student, a young person, I'd never even been to Hartford. And here's this person who's done this work with Mark Twain. And he, he was on top of the scholarship and the books and the blizzard of articles that he wrote at the time that he was uh, kickstarting all of this. He was also uh, obviously an entertainer with a really keen <clears throat> journalist's sensibility about what the public really will respond to and how they, uh, uh, how to engage people. So uh, that's a rare combination. I mean, we, we, we all know uh, academics who kind of talk into their uh, chest and and, and, and use language and terminology that normal people don't understand. And Bill was the antithesis of that. And yet his scholarship was pure and his respect for the content was just dazzling. So I think that that's it, you know, always with an ear out. In a funny way, it was probably, you could say, whether it was a curse or a blessing, he had two, three actually, major um, uh, assignments each one of which involved uh, nationally significant treasures that, were, that had no money and almost no hope. And one might wish that on their worst enemy, to be stuck with a, a, a task that is so hard and so hopeless. But it is proof that God may still be watching that Bill actually was the person given those assignments because he was a resourceful problem solver and Mark Twain truly was without help or hope in the 50s and early 60s when this thing started to gel and it was blessed with great benefactors. But I think it also made him resilient and resourceful. If you are sitting on a mountain of money, uh, you can kind of lock the door and throw away the key and not worry about what anyone thinks. But he never had that choice. And it toughened him up, and it made him smarter, and it made him a much better public servant. Uh, Jared, tell us a little bit about the condition of the Mark Twain house when uh, Bill came along. I believe he started as a summer intern. Uh, yes. Uh, the, I met Bill when I came to Hartford. I was put on the board of the, uh, the Mark Twain house. And Bill was a summer intern and had been for a number of years. Um, and the amazing thing was that before we arrived, uh, the Mark Twain House had a whole uh, group of perhaps a dozen uh, dedicated uh, volunteers who had set about researching every moment that the Clemens family were living in Hartford. And they even listed every room in the house and what role it played to eat for each member of the family, et cetera, et cetera. So that set a frame for research. Neither of us had anything uh, to do with, except we realized that it was the basis of which all future activity at the house was, had to be based. Um, Bill uh, went through his growing up and his going to college at Hobart and his going into the Army and his getting his master's degree at Trinity and all of those things, always he came back to the Mark Twain. And when I became head of the board, I made uh, a rather rash suggestion that the uh, Mark Twain house restore itself to the era that Louis Comfort, Tiffany and Associated Artists had decorated the house because knowing how significant they were as a design firm taking really an, an unfinished residence and making a dazzling statement, obviously of Mark Twain's uh, desire for recognition. And um, Bill immediately was there and remembered so many of the facts and figures that the volunteers had uh, put together. And we became a team, uh, and as it turned out, um, we completed the restoration. I say we because uh, there was a restoration committee of five architects, and they couldn't agree on anything um, <laughs> because it was a matter of personal taste. Right. 
And we discovered, Bill and I discovered, that if you could prove that the physical evidence identified that this was, in fact, what it what, uh, was there, um, they would all agree. And so that process resulted in the Mark Twain house. And room by room, feature by feature, everything was revealed by chipping off paint or trying to find photographs and doing all that. If we didn't know what was there, we would have to just move on and uh, uh, sort of like in painting and pictures and stuff like that. So uh, that was an experience that completed in the Mark Twain House restoration, which is, you all are familiar with. But it was an experience that the two of us had shared and learned everything that we do from. And then fast forward to the old State House, uh, when in 1988, um, I believe the State House board uh, was truly considering doing restoration of this building. And among the first acts they did was to create a building committee made up of people in Hartford who knew how buildings were put together and maintained. And that this was facilities managers of the major uh, insurance companies in downtown. And Ed Richardson here in the front row was the first chairman of the building committee. And for 10 years, he basically sat on that committee, kept us out of trouble, uh, kept us on track. Uh, and the result is surrounded, surrounding you here today. Um, I'll go into that more in detail. Bill Hosley, I think you have something you wanted to say. Well, just, uh, you know, uh, the point Jared's making, and actually for those that haven't seen this book, uh, Bill wrote this in 1978, and, and it I'll was... And I'll say it is available on Amazon. Okay. There are copies out yeah. there. And it, it, it was called uh, The Renaissance of Mark Twain's House, A Handbook for Restoration. And it was really an account of this extraordinary journey uh, that Jared just described. At that time, in the early 70s, the science of restoration was just emerging as a concept. Prior to that time, it, it was a lot of guesswork and you know, kind of taste, individualistic taste, as Jared referred to. Who's to say, because taste is relative and we don't really know anyway. Well, Jared and Bill and others proved that you could know, that you could do a kind of archeological exactness with the, with the analysis of the physical properties and the, the documentation and sometimes photographic records and you could really, really get it right. And that was just emerging, so the Mark Twain house became kind of an, a nationally significant icon of the, essentially the professionalization of this science at a time when everybody was kind of, or many people were kind of curious about it. And I should just, this is a brief quote. Uh, the introduction to this book was written by Oliver Jensen. Some of you may know that name, but he literally was the Ken Burns of his generation, who, who through American Heritage Magazine, which was the gold standard for popularization of history, he wrote the introduction to this book, and, um, and, and he talked about how uh, it, it looked like the homeowner might, after they got done with this first phase of restoration, might have just turned the key and departed an hour ago. And then he says, I love this, he quotes Mark Twain himself in this wonderful introduction. He said, few things are harder to put up with than the annoyance of a good example. <laughs> <laughs> the achievement of the Mark Twain house is going to make things unbearable for a lot of people in the field of restoration. And, and I think that you know, part of Bill's uh, no question that he had an obsessive attention to detail. He sweated the details. And for people that do that, that can be annoying to the rest of us <laughs> because they're perfectionists. And it required that kind of perfectionism to get it right and particularly to, and essentially with Jared and others, invent a new science of restoration. I want to, um, we're going to move on to talk more about the old state house because we're sitting here. But I did want to ask you, Tom, for people who may be watching this program that are not familiar with what the Mark Twain house had been before the restoration, um, you said, you know, uh, Bill was the one that recognized this potential. Tell people what kind of shape it had been in and what it had been used for. I mean, it wasn't the nationally known landmark it is now. Well, it had, been a, it had a number of uses, right? It was a, it was a li branch library at one time, wasn't it, wasn't it, Derek? Wood School, 
yep. um, occupied it. Uh, then it was bought by Miss Day next door, and it was co converted into a, uh, it was divided up into apartments. Mm -hmm. And so it was really an apartment house uh, until the, the, I guess it was in the late 50s, when the board of the Mark Twain Memorial was created, and their first act was to invite the Hartford Public Library to open a branch in the old parlor of the house. But the rest of the house was fully occupied. You know, you said he was the one who really recognized his potential. It's hard to believe now with all the national attention that it gets that people didn't see that before. It, it, there really was a sea change, and, and, and Bill notes that the, you know, the science of preservation, but also the realization of the, of the value of it. I mean, I mean it, t today, anyone suggesting demolishing this building would be, you know, would be run out of town on a rail. I were laughed out. Of, you know, I mean, it would be thought to be absurd. But it was taken seriously mm -hmm. 45 years ago. And, and, and uh, you know, the, the, the value of it. I mean, I think that, <clears throat> you know, you, looking at the 20th century, you know, the, there was uh, the, the recession and the war that kind of lost the sense of how, of how cities were made and how they were valuable. And then the coming of, you know, the post-war, uh, you know, the, you see the USA and your Chevrolet and suburban sprawl and everything, and things that, that made cities valuable were for a time forgotten. And then they were rediscovered again, thank God. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, because, it, I mean, millions of people have come to Hartford, millions, not, not, and that's not an exaggeration, to see the Mark Twain House and the old state house. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can't, I mean, to imagine the city without them is almost impossible. But we could very well have, have the same, and we lost, we did lose a few great landmark buildings. Yeah. Jared, so. when the two of you started on this project, paint the picture of what this place looked like. Well, the uh, Old State House Association had been formed, and they were very good custodians of the building. Um, I remember that they had done uh, some initial uh, improvements to the building, which were uh, to remove. Uh, the Houses of Comfort, as they were uh, referred to, <laughs> uh, which were the public toilets in the basement. And then um, they sort of stopped there, and Bill had, uh, at this time, uh, really envisioned something much larger. And uh, so when uh, Tyler and I were invited to come to uh, consult and assist them uh, in this, uh, the actually the building committee's first commitment was uh, to hire two critical research studies, uh, which were the foundation for the entire project. Uh, the first was by the amazing uh, Connecticut resource, Bruce Cluett. And Bruce wrote a document after researching every surviving paper in the state library related to the old state house. Every bill, every, the minutes of every meeting of the building committee uh, in the 1790s, if you can imagine this. But he organized it as I, as I requested uh, to put all the information in headings such as exterior stonework, uh, brickwork, uh, windows, uh, ornaments, uh, uh, paint finishes, uh, all these things. So he sorted them all out so that um, when it came time to do more uh, construction documents uh, for the restoration, there was this uh, organized file of chr chronologically of information and you could uh, read uh, what was done and why. The other critical study was completed by a consulting firm in Boston called Building Conservation Associates. And they were conservation materials cons conservators. So they came down and like uh, uh, diagnosticians, they took every, they investigated everything, the brick, the mortar, where the brick was changed, where the mortar was changed, what evidence there was of what colors where. Um, what kind of designs were in the walls if they survived, et cetera, et cetera. So all of the physical evidence, uh, they did this exhaustive study on. So between the, that latter study 
and Bruce Clouet's historical chronology, uh, we were able to basically open up this, like an accordion, mm -hmm. from 1996, really, uh, to the mid-'80s and understand how everything changed. And then there's another phase of this I could talk later. Bill, there were um, several restorations prior to the one that we see now. Um, and sort of a controversial decision was made, I guess by the committee, to restore different parts of the building to different periods um, throughout its history. Is that something that is, I'm saying it's controversial because that's what I've read, um, is that controversial among historians and among preservationists to do something like that? No, I think it's very progressive and interesting. I mean, uh, uh, people have sort of a stereotypical sense of what a, a uh, house museum or a historic site ought to be, uh, and the idea that you would put everything back to one period is an option. But I actually think it's less interesting than the kind of layering of history that you see, where you, where if I recall, is it the Senate chamber that is kind of 19th century, or is it the other way around? <laughs> like anyway, but they, they, <clears throat> and then, and then of course adding the Stewards Museum. I mean. Uh, was just a, sort of a brilliant thing. And, and I think that the, the beauty of the old state house uh, uh, at, at the time of its full consummation of his vision, which took all the years that he was there, is that it really was a six ring circus where you had the Stewart's Museum, you had the cannon going off at noon, you had the costumed interpreters, uh, you had uh, th th this incredible puppet theater in the basement that did this uh, Charter Oak story. I mean, who would come up with that? Uh, and uh, <laughs> obviously a museum shop and then the Amistad dramatizations yeah. Yeah. that Tom referred to. And that is, in my view, squeezing the nectar out of a resource. Mm -hmm. All of these things, like a building like this, to me represents, uh, you know, it's a big piece of, of hardware. Mm -hmm. And if you don't program it, like the software element, then it's just a nice, pretty big piece of hardware. But Bill had a genius yeah. for the software. Yeah. Tom? You know, just uh, uh, amplifying that, I mean, part of Bill's challenge here, I think, is, is that for a lot of the years this building existed, it was just a government building. I mean, there were, you know, it was the, the House and the Senate coming in and doing what they, doing what they do over at the Capitol, probably a little better, but, uh, um, <laughs> but low bar. Well, 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 uh, well, withhold judgment, but, but, um, and and I mean, you, you look throughout its history, and you know, you can you can connect it to the Charter Oak incident from the earlier building. You can, the the um, Constitutional Convention of 1818, which um, uh, finally. Uh, uh, de, uh, deinstitutionalizes the uh, the um, congregational church, uh, you know, ma major deal. Um, the Hartford Convention during the War of 1812, a major ma major national incident. The Amistad trial, but but you know, it, it, those and those those are all hugely significant to the history of Connecticut. But I mean, it's not the Independence Hall, you know, na national impact. So Bill's challenge is. How can you teach the history, make the building interesting, and uh, and and you know, and just imbibe the the spirit of it to the to children and adults? And he did that, and and it was an amazing accomplishment. Mm -hmm. Well, in fact, uh, there was a comment that I read recently from a member of the restoration committee, and he said. Bill was a promoter, the likes of which we haven't seen since. He wasn't promoting a building, he was promoting a building as symbolic of what it means to Connecticut history. I think that's what you both were saying. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so once you start working on this, it's very painstaking. I went through some of the videos and every bit of it is documented and there are loose leaf folders this thick, several of them, that are marked with everything that they had to go through. So it's a monumental task and yet, it seems as though um, it really just kind of, you know, for people who see it now, it seems as though, well, of course, this is how it always was. And when you see that video and you see what was added and what was taken away, it's, it's really pretty astonishing. Well, one of the um, uh, treats in working on this building, uh, after we had decided uh, that the appropriate philosophy for its restoration was to take the period in its history uh, that was represented by the most surviving physical features. For example, this room was never here. It's pr until 1920, 
Um, it had four columns, not eight. Uh, the columns were simply posts, and it was as ornamented as a congregational church in Derrier. When the restoration was being done from 1914 to 1920, they decided that this should be, uh, that, that perhaps was undignified, and so they decided that the Dara Hall in Bullfinch's Massachusetts State House would be the appropriate model for this. So guess where these columns came from? So um, th they were very creative, but this was so perfect. I mean, it was all painted white. We just changed the color a little to a kind of off-white, and that was it because it was pure 1920, perfect. The exterior, even more fascinatingly, um, had always been painted, always painted. And it wasn't until 1920 when they stripped the paint off, it became a brick building. And we, of course, think, oh, it's a Georgian building, it's just like Williamsburg, it's perfect, you know? Uh-uh, it, it was painted a pale pink. And if you don't believe it, look at sheet music published in the 1830s. There were colored lithographs, always pale pink. And back to the Building Conservation Associates report, up in the third floor attic, they found a piece of the exterior wall. It's too complicated oh to know how it got there, but it's in its original position. And it had all the layers of exterior paint on it. And the part that was unpainted was in fact the original lime wash, pale pink. So, who knew? <laughs> By the way, if anybody has questions, please raise your hand and we'll come to you with a microphone if you'd like to, to make a comment or, or ask a question about something. Um, I, I don't want this to get away from us. I know it's not the most important thing, but Paul Jaguer mentioned how Bill will get on the air on that West Hartford TV station and say, if anyone knows someone who owns a two-headed calf, contact me. How did they actually find it? Do you remember, Jerry? Oh, yes, I, I do, because um, I think somewhere uh, in the public media on a winter's morning, uh, there was a little um, sentence somewhere that said in Minnesota, perhaps it was Wisconsin, I'm not sure, a farmer had uh, seen his uh, cow uh, give birth to a two-headed calf. Well, Bill, <laughs> Janet could probably remember this, Bill rushed to get the name of the farmer and proposed that he acquire uh, this poor creature uh, for the purpose of display in the Stewards Museum. And I don't know the details. I guess I don't care to know the details. <laughs> how it got from the farm to the case upstairs. <laughs> it's there nevertheless. Maybe we're better off not knowing that, yeah. And for those who have admired the Bengal tiger that was in the video, that turned out to be a bit of a problem. Well, yes, um, in the restoration, um, for example, the upholstery fabrics all are the correct fabric. The, um, and G Jane Nylander, who uh, was the, really the queen bee of textiles, uh, now retired uh, head of uh, historic New England. Um, she had was consulting on the fabrics and she picked these perfectly beautiful things made simply out of wool or linen or things. And in the state, in the Senate chamber, there were these benches under the windows, so-called benches, with a cherry red wool moire fabric. Beautiful. Uh, and about a year or so after the building opened, um, Marion Leonard, uh, who was very assistant Ed Richardson here uh, with, the, uh, with the Restoration Committee, she said, oh, Jared, she said, something terrible has happened. All the settees seem to have developed this kind of fuzz, and we're not sure what it was. Well, after a few weeks, uh, it was discovered that there had been an infestation of mo moths, and that this uh, the wool was delicious. And, <laughs> and how did the moths get into the old steakhouse? Well, it was the Bengal tiger who, God knows what it was stuffed with, and it had been in, on storage out at the Children's Museum for years. And as soon as they came into the nice climate change of Steward's Museum, the rest of it, they had to fumigate the whole building. Oh, no. uh, a mess. Tom, um, one of the things that uh, Bill Foudy said was uh, the reason that we fire the cannon is so that they don't forget we're here. <laughs> well, I think that was that was part of it. You know, that was uh, 
he, you know, he was a he was a showman. He was a promoter in in the you know in the cause of teaching. Uh -huh. And uh, sure, they, you know, cannons were contemporary with the building, and and uh, the uniforms were, and people would jump out of the buildings around here and go watch it. And and again, you know, it it, it was something that made downtown Hartford more interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know another factor in economic development. There was another thing I wanted to mention because I was I was looking up at the balcony, and I, I, one time the, uh, some um, other leaders of nonprofit organizations were picking Bill's brain about you know how to run their um, how to run their shops, and I just remember this one thing. He, he said, "Remember, if you get a grant to paint the second floor, don't paint the first floor with it." <laughs> <laughs> the guy was being careful with his, he was being careful with his money. But yeah, no, I think I mean I think that but the can you know the canons and you know the reenactments. I wrote, I wrote a column once. He, he he was he reenacted the Charter Oak incident. Everybody knows right where they they hid the charter in the tree. Everybody's got that it becomes the state symbol and everything. So Bill reenacted it one time. It was tremendously popular. So one of the one of the current reporters said, asked him if he was going to do it every year. And he said, quote, I dare not disclose all for fear that the monarchy will snuff us out. Tom's <laughs> 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 anyway. remarks um, remind me that um, uh, in, I guess it was 1989, uh, the New York Times in January 28th carried an article identifying that Bill was asking the owners of buildings whose windows overlook his historic <laughs> structure to pay for the view. He believes that the view tax, as he calls it, is nothing more than the fair share of businesses that can afford it. <laughs> there is Bill, and remember the window tax. As it was I, I think it came to be known as the window tax, right? <laughs> If anybody has a question, please uh, please let us know. Raise your hand, and we're happy to come to you with a microphone. Um, the window tax. You know, that's just a, a little bit of genius, right? It, people paid it. I mean, that was, you know, I mean, it, you know, yeah, it was genius. Bill, is that what you yeah. meant when you called him an impresario? Well, uh, yeah, sure. I mean, and, and really, uh, we talk, the word entrepreneur gets bandied about. Yeah. But uh, one thing related to that, and uh, with your background uh, in, in the media and anybody who is worked in uh, for the current or any other, you, you'll, this will be familiar. Uh, Bill endeared himself to, to the press and political class uh, mm -hmm. most of the time mm -hmm. because he was always accessible, always spoke on the record, wasn't coy, manipulative, or stupid. Mm -hmm. And, <laughs> and y you know... <laughs> But, but I, th I think people in life are often risk averse. Yeah. It's a pretty common. And they're a little afraid, well, if I, if I say something and it's wrong and now it's in the public record, I could be criticized. Mm -hmm. And Bill was never afraid to do that. And by endearing himself to the press and being actually the go-to guy, not just on Twain and, uh, and the Mark Twain house, yeah. but on anything historical yeah. related yeah. and preservation related, People like Tom knew that if he picked up the phone yeah. and called Bill, he'd get a quote yeah. that would be printable. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a yeah. And 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 so that kept the profile. People say, well, he was a self-promoter. Well, that's it wasn't about him. Mm -hmm. It was about the causes he was he cared mm -hmm. for and making sure, just like the canon, uh, that people don't forget we're here. Yeah. Yeah. Tom, you said that his uh, knowledge of Hartford history was pretty extraordinary. Oh, oh, uh, uh, astonishing. Uh, and and it, it, I mean, you know, he knew which families lived where. And I mean, I, mean, I, think, I, I think he knew which Native American families <laughs> lived on the hill. I mean, he, he was, uh, you know, uh, you know for everyone, everyone calls Asylum Hill Asylum Hill, right? But Bill knew it was originally Lord's Hill. <laughs> And, and when I lived in that neighborhood, he would frequently so how are things at Lord's Hill? <laughs> God bless you. No, no it, it, it's really true. But, but he, Bill was so upfront and honest that, that there were years when he couldn't buy bad publicity. Yeah. And it served, served the building very well. 
Uh, I saw somebody with a hand. Yeah. Yes, uh, I don't know how many of you here actually knew Bill Fowdy personally, uh, but you're probably getting the idea, if you didn't know him, that he was a larger-than-life person, mm -hmm. which is the understatement. Uh, but I would just like to pay tribute to him because he had an extraordinary impact on my life. Shortly after this place opened, uh, I had a, a group called the American Music Theater Group, and we were devoted to doing historical performances of American music. And we started off here in Hartford in this room. Uh, and I was tremendously saddened by uh, Bill's passing, but it, it has brought back so many wonderful things. His influence on this community is so profound, it's very hard to imagine anyone to whom he can be compared. And I would just like to publicly thank him for the enormous trust that he had in this community and this building. Thank you, Bill, very, very much. We miss you. Yeah. When you and I were talking uh, prior to this conversation, you used a term that I thought was wonderful when you talked about uh, Bill Foudy, and you said he was brimming with conviction about the great things the city had to offer. Brimming with conviction. I think that's so him. Well, it's, uh, you, you know, it, it, it's a cross to bear sometimes uh, if you uh, care about something that isn't fashionable. Yeah. And uh, Hartford has not always loved its history. And I think back to... Uh, the first person, really, you could credit with saving the old state house goes all the way back to 1910, and that was uh, the late, late Emily Holcomb, mm -hmm. who was a colonial dame, and she w w had restored the ancient burying ground, and she'd done other things. And to read her own language, the way she described the importance of this work, is to be completely inspired by that sense of deep-rooted conviction. And in 1910, uh, this old state house was slated for demolition again. Mm -hmm. And uh, the colonial dames raised the first public money, and it probably helped that her husband was the CEO of uh, the, the Phoenix. But, uh, <laughs> but, but she and they were able to corral the business community and get them to take this seriously and, and, to, and to leverage essentially the colonial dame's money and to raise the money needed to keep this from being demolished the first time. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that you have to be able to, uh, another person, uh, 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 Bill knew well, uh, didn't know personally because he died in 1944, uh -huh. but knew well through the record is the late George Dudley Seymour from New Haven who was also on the the board of the Connecticut Historical Society and the board of the Wadsworth Athenaeum and, and a person who um, talked about the life of the reformer being hard, the person who is uh, standing up for something that is, is a minority position, just like in women's rights and anti-slavery. There are times in life where you, if you are going to stand for something that isn't popular, you, you, you're, you're, you're going to be attacked or you're going to be, you know, at least not supported. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what carried him. And I think he had faith in, in the importance of this material like you could never surpass. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jared, this is probably one of the more minor things that happened here, but I can't help but be noticed, but be struck by it every time I walk past the building or come in, and that's the beautiful fence and those gold statues at the top. Um, where did that whole idea come from? Well, let's see. The fence actually is documented when the first cameras started taking pictures around Hartford. Um, the cast iron fence was recorded physically. Visually, but was it there when you the started business. the restoration? No, 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 no. It had been removed. It had been gone. Okay. Um, it was probably removed at the time that this a very large granite post office, uh, which was about 20 feet in front of the <laughs> building over here to my left, uh, when that was built, that was when all the earlier fence mm -hmm. uh, came down. And when Bill realized that he had a security uh, issue here uh, around the old state house, he was advocating put back the the fence, because the fence conveniently was on the perimeter mm -hmm. of the property, and there's the historic um, uh, documentation, so that recreating it was, was actually a possibility. Mm -hmm. Won't go into those details. But the gold statues um, on the flagpoles have no historical reference to fact at all. Um, it was simply that... <laughs> this is what we call artistic license. It was simply that Bill thought that it would be um, more festive if there were a number of <laughs> flag 
poles around in which God knows what uh, flags he would fly, be they, um, you know, pennants of some kind. But um, he also was amused by the idea of putting those tiny little figures on top. Mm -hmm. um, and I was trying to figure out the, how well, many of the two, four, six of them are there, um, and who those guys were. <laughs> and, uh, of course, one of them was Thomas Hooker, but one of them was Joseph Wadsworth, who uh, was the fellow who grabbed the, the charter, I guess, when the lights went out. Um, but I don't know who the others were, and, but somewhere in the historical record of the building committee, there will be a report on who they are. I think one of them is uh, you. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not true. <laughs> Uh, any, uh, anybody else want to make a remark or have a comment? Yes, sir. Right here, and then we'll go there. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Will K. Wilkins. I run Real Artways. And, Good to uh, see you, Will. And nice to see you, too, Diane, and everybody else. Um, I uh, first met Bill shortly after I came to work in Hartford, and the circumstances were perhaps inauspicious. Um, he, he had, uh, on behalf of the old state house at a time when they were still trying to renovate this whole place, had uh, put out a call for an exhibition, and they wanted artists to submit work, and the exhibition was going to be called The Streets of Hartford. And uh, unknown to Bill, there was an artist, James Monford, whose work uh, deals in racial stereotypes very intentionally to provoke a response. Yeah. Monford submitted a work into this show. Nobody read it really closely, but it had renamed different Hartford streets with racial stereotypes Ooh. and racial slurs. So this made the papers because a security guard at the old state house, who was, I think, African American or Jamaican, read the actual words on this and said, This is outrageous, and Bill removed it from the show. So Tom Condon and his friends at the Hartford Current put a big headline up on the paper that said, Artwork Censored at Old State House. <laughs> I, I had just come to town, and I happened to be aware of Monford because he had done a project with Real Artways, so I thought, maybe this is the right opportunity to get to know Bill Fowdy. Uh, <laughs> So, That's a great so story. I, I called him up, and, and uh, you know what I got to know about Bill at that point, you know, at the beginning of our relationship, was this was a man who listened, and he was a man who had the courage to change his mind and to and to respond to what was going on. So, the upshot of this whole thing was that Monfort's work stayed removed from the show but a, a, an exhibition solely of his work that put it in context for the audience to understand. Bill mounted that. Bill supported a panel discussion about race and representation and who decides. And ended, the old state house ended up looking like it was in favor of free expression, which it was. It helped the artist out. And in the course of this connection with Bill, I came to realize that there was a deeper level of connection between the old state house and Real Artways, when I saw a headline uh, at the, uh, that was from the paper at the time that Real Artways was being thrown out of the space directly across the street here at 40 State Street. And it said, the headline said, Parking Garage to Replace Avant-Garde Art Center. <laughs> I've always held Bill closely in my heart, and uh, I'm very sorry for your loss, Janet. And uh, wonderful man to celebrate. Thank, thank you, Will. It's a great story. Hi, I'm Ed Richardson, which Jared said I was on the building committee. And uh, I just want to tell you something about a little uh, drama that occurred. And I think my memory is correct, but it's not very good, so don't trust it too far. We had blown a big hole in this lawn out there, uh, west of the building, between this building and Main Street, to put a new, a new uh, room down below, way down. And what it did was provide a fine meeting room, and it also allowed us to, uh, to uh, keep this building from sinking into the ground. It was slowly sinking over there. 
So with the big hole that we blew out with the dynamite, which made the city not very happy, I can tell you, <laughs> uh, uh, it, uh, it enabled us to, to fix up that, that uh, sinking place over there. But one of the problems that arose was that we needed a sewer outlet to go down to the level of uh, uh, State Street to get an outlet to the, to the uh, uh, sewer system. And next door, up to 1930, I think, as Jared said, was the old, was the old post office, a massive uh, granite building, I believe, just uh, right outside there. And we had gotten from the uh, uh, Library of Congress archives a WPA drawing of all the foundations of that building so that the, the contractors who were bidding on building that sewer line down through that lawn there uh, were all advised as to the foundations of the old post office. And we thought we were all set. They all been, been informed. Well, we weren't completely informed because we got a call and they said, hey, there's something wrong here. We got through these foundations and out in the middle of the foundation is a block building there. We don't know what it is. Well, it turned out to be a vault, a reinforced concrete room, which the old post office had had. And here we are faced with, and it's right in the path of the, uh, the sewer line. Oh, no. Well, so and we couldn't uh, blow up any more stuff. The city, <laughs> city, city wouldn't let us do it. And so what we did, we got the biggest mechanical jackhammer in the country, a giant machine of 80 or 90 feet tall, I believe it was. And it came in finally and pounded that that uh, old vault to, to dust so they could do it. And uh, the city wouldn't let us, as you say, blow it up anymore, but we, we got away with it. And uh, all Bill had to do was raise some more money to get that, <laughs> that fixed. So I give you, uh, after 10 years of working with him, a, a four word description of Bill, which I think is right on the money. It is Bill, Fa Bill uh, Foudy, uh, always quotable, never quotidian. Thank you. <laughs> Bill, over here. Claire. I'm Claire Edwards. And I have known, had known Bill for absolutely forever. I think we were, I was uh, two years ahead of him, I think, in school, but that goes back to nursery school, so we go back a long, long, long way. And I can't even tell you the number of times I would call Bill up and say, Bill, what was the name of that great toy store on LaSalle Road? Or, Bill, do you remember what used to stand on the corner of South Main Street and the boulevard? Or, Bill, what was the scoop on John's first wife? Or, and he knew <laughs> everything. He absolutely knew everything. And it was just so extraordinary because um, actually two days before Bill died, Jared and I were at a party, and somebody came up and asked me a question about something, and I said, oh, God, I have no idea. You're going to have to call Bill Foudy. <laughs> <laughs> and he did know everyone and everything. Yeah. And he loved to share all that information. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Okay. It's been a great presentation by all of you. I'd like to say that if you'd like to look at Bill's last effort to bring uh, Connecticut history to the forefront, the Connecticut Historical Society uh, with Bill's real efforts, put together uh, a program which is still there for about another week, which is called Why Connecticut is the Constitution State. Mm -hmm. And uh, this goes deeply back to Thomas Hooker for remarks he made in 1638 in church that man should be governed by men and not by the crown of England. And uh, Connecticut is the only state that had a charter 
the charter that was taken was actually something that Governor Winthrop went to England to petition to continue Connecticut's democracy because we had state legislators, I mean, not state, but uh, Windsor, Wethersfield, Hartford, sent representatives to represent us as uh, rep elected officials. By the, and this continued when, when he went to get Charles's opinion. He gave them somehow this charter to do this. Of course, 10 years later, they wanted it back, so they came back here to get it, <laughs> and it was gone. <laughs> But the, Funny the, how that worked the, out. the exhibit is well worth seeing. It has original documents out there in view at the Connecticut Historical Society. Thank so you for thank bringing you. that up. I think we're going to have to bring the program to a close, so I'd like to let each of you kind of have a, a final thought uh, about Bill. Tom, I'll start with you. Well, it, you know, I think, you know, I'm... I miss him because he was one of my, <laughs> I <I've coughs> spent 40, or, uh, 40 years calling him and asking him questions like that. I mean, he would be, he would, um, uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, what, uh, you know, just one example, I, I, I was trying to figure out why they buried the Park River. You know, I, I mean, because he had this beautiful river going through the park, and, and, I, and, and I could never get a good answer. And I, I called Bill. He said, oh, yeah, I can tell you that. You know, it was so-and-so, you know, Harry Schmidlap wanted to widen the highway, <laughs> and the only way he could pull it off was to, was to bury the river. Oh. <laughs> anyway, he, I mean, it's it just, uh, one, one, you know, what can you say? A wonderful guy, a great teacher. Um, you know, Bill Foudy and Mike Peters left office at about the same time, and Harford went from technicolor to black and white. Uh, three brief things worth noting that are part of the record. The last, I forget what year he left the old state house. Uh, 2000? 2001. 2001. The last 15 years of his life were highly productive in very interesting ways. Um, uh, the, uh, one of the best things I ever saw at Wadsworth Athenaeum was Bill Foudy's 150th anniversary exhibition on Bushnell Park that resurrected a whole world of associations and social experience, capturing the essence of Hartford at the height of the urban age. And he borrowed things from all over, and it was just, you know, and this thing was done on a shoestring, and it was absolutely brilliant. The other very important thing, and he spent years doing this and loved every minute of it, was the excavation of the Hartford City Archives at City Hall. This was, the, the miracle is that these things weren't destroyed, but nobody knew what they had, nobody knew where they were. He spent years organizing the material, sorting through it, and I remember visiting him there at, at City Hall in the archives, and he was just like a kid in a candy store with the things he was discovering. And, you, you know, a next generation and a next generation beyond that of scholars and students of Hartford history, if we're so lucky, uh, will um, be benefit greatly from those discoveries. And the, fi the final thing, it's, it's, it's not small. I just was doing a little project myself on the second North District School up in the, the north end of Hartford. And Bill, he may have done many, many projects I don't know about, but did, uh, uh, was commissioned by the former uh, uh, Hartford Public Librarian, Matt Poland, to do a, really a history of the public schools in Hartford. And there are so many schools that you, it's hard to keep track of them all, but he did this encyclopedic analysis, and it's also interesting. And he never stopped learning, never stopped being curious. Thank you, Bill. Jared? <clears throat> well, I couldn't um, uh, think of a particular event. Uh, there are so many to remember. Um, but what I, what I really uh, feel in the end is a, the great loss, because through all the years of working together on numerous projects, um, Bill and I became really close friends. And for at least the last 15 years, um, maybe every other month we'd get together for lunch um, and we would talk about, guess what? What was going on at the Mark Twain house? Uh -huh. Was it good or wasn't it quite so good? Um, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, that was always a great treat, and really up until two weeks before he died, um, we lunched uh, and talked. And um, 
Those are conversations that I wish I could recall, um, but they're lost and gone forever. And I'm sorry for that. Well, thank you all for being here. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. I hope that uh, you enjoyed this as much as we did. Uh, Janet, thank you so much for being here, and thank you for sharing Bill with us all these years. I hope that you will tune in to um, CTN to be able to see this program on television. You'll be able to download it on ct-n.com if you'd like to tell your neighbors and friends about it. I'm sure they're going to want to see it too. Thank you so much for being here today.